Welcome everyone. Uh, Jeff Jensen, Director of Community Programs here with Trees Forever. Uh, I'm joined by Josh Balk, um, a watershed coordinator, a source water coordinator, both coordinators um, in the Dry Run Creek uh, watershed. So just a couple of things to get us started. Um, welcome, welcome. Again, you should be able to hear and see us, but we can't hear and see you. So the way that you can interact with us is through the questions tab. Uh, our agenda today is real straightforward. We're going to be talking about landscaping for water quality and some of the work being done in Dry Run Creek that uh, Josh is intimately involved with. I want to mention that uh, we have our webinars roughly every two weeks for stewards of the beautiful land. And so in two weeks, we're going to be talking about pollinators with our pollinator palooza. So be sure to check that out. Uh, get it registered, pardon me, through our GoTo webinar registrations. Um, there it is. There we go. I'm also going to bring in Sheila Weldon. Uh, she has been teaching uh, through the honey producers, just new honey, honey producers, growers, honey beekeepers. That's what I was trying to say. She's been uh, teaching new beekeepers through the Iowa Honey Association for a long time, and she'll be joining us to talk a little bit about some of those managed honeybees. And uh, I think we're even going to do a little video on some of the equipment that they use. So that'll be fun. You can learn more about Stewards of the Beautiful Land uh, by going to our web uh, website, clicking on the Learn tab, and then Stewards of the Beautiful Land, and that'll bring up the landing page here, or again, you can get registered for all of our webinars from noon to one. That's when they take place roughly every two weeks. And then, of course, our in-person field days. And so those, well, actually, we had our first one last night. Uh, we had a nice group of people came together in Hampton, and we did a tremendous presentation about uh, growing your tree canopy and then went into Hampton and saw some of the great projects that uh, Randy Sanders, uh, they call him Johnny Appleseed because he's planted so many trees in Hampton and surrounding communities that it's unbelievable and uh, had a really nice evening. And so that was our first field day for Stewards of the Beautiful Land. And we have one tonight in Carroll County and then a couple more coming up here towards the end of the month. Again, all of that information is on that Stewards of the Beautiful Land web page on the Trees Forever website. Again, like I mentioned, there's that questions tab for folks. Uh, if you have a question, please go ahead and type it in there. Um, we're gonna be about an hour. Again, the nice part about webinars is you can uh, get up, stretch, use the restroom if you need to. Let's not delay any further. We have Josh Balk with the Iowa DNR, a watershed and source water coordinator. And so let's get into it. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh Balk. I'm a watershed and source water protection coordinator here with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And for the last eight years or so, I've had the pleasure of working on the Dry Run Creek Watershed Improvement Project. And with that, um, I've had uh, a large focus on urban conservation. And it's actually a subject I'm really passionate about. I enjoy talking about it. So I really appreciate the opportunity to come be here with you today and appreciate Trees Forever for involving me in this. So because we're meeting here virtually today, I can't take you out and show you all the wonderfulness that is Dry Run Creek. Uh, so instead, we'll just give a little bit of background information about the watershed project and why we're talking about it. So Dry Run Creek is located here in Black Hawk County. It's about a 15,000 acre watershed and has a dendrous network of drainage channels. And with that, it starts in uh, the rural agricultural lands and then winds its way through the city of Cedar Falls. So along the way, it touches agricultural land, includes uh, regular field crops as well as some livestock areas. And then in our urban areas, it touches industrial, commercial, residential, as well as some natural areas, all before it outlets to the Cedar River. So we do have a diverse land use mix here in the watershed. And one thing we've noticed over the years of monitoring is an increase in the urbanization. Um, so not only is there um, urban sprawl where our agricultural lands are being converted and developed, 
but our highest intense areas of urbanization are becoming even more urbanized. So more hard surfaces, more buildings, and that kind of stuff. And so why I'm even talking about this, or why we're even talking about Dry Run Creek in general, is because Dry Run Creek faces two state designated water quality impairments. We have high levels of bacteria, and we also have a biological impairment, which means we'd have um, a low diversity and quantity of aquatic creatures, including both fish and benthic macroinvertebrates, which are creatures that live in and around the streams so for some part of their life cycle. And what we found through monitoring is stormwater runoff is a contributing cause and the major contributing cause to our water quality impairments. So you might ask yourself, why focus on stormwater? Well, that leads us to a, a rich history that we get to dive into here. So we're gonna jump in a magical time machine of imagination and go back a few hundred years in Iowa. And what we predominantly see as the landform regions throughout our state, number one was prairie, or more notably, the tall grass prairie. And that stretched from river to river. And then we also had many wetland features um, throughout the land as well. And if you look at these, these are vegetated areas. Um, we had plants growing year, year after year, growing, decaying, dying, and breaking down and then contributing their organic matter. And that built up over the, the years uh, since our last glaciation here thousands of years ago. And so with that, we had very high organic rich soils that, that built up over the years. And it's estimated that Iowa had about 70% of our state covered with this native prairie system. And you can see the blue squiggly lines are our river systems and pockets of wetlands. You see some woodland forested areas as well. Um, but I would say that's, that's generally what our state consisted of. So when settlers came to our state, they saw this rich organic matter soils, some of the best in the world, and identified how great of an opportunity it would be. And so a lot of the prairie lands were tilled up and converted to uh, crop production, livestock use. And we also found that a lot of our wetland areas were drained to make use of this land as well. So just within the last couple hundred, few hundred years, we lost a significant amount of our native prairie heritage. Uh, right now we have less than one tenth of 1% of that tall grass native prairie remaining. And so if you look at those blue squiggly lines, going from crops that were grown year round, uh, growing and decaying, dying over thousands of years, and then we switch to agricultural crop, row crop usage, where it only has plants growing on there certain times of the year, that's a very big change, um, especially from a hydrologic perspective on how these rivers and systems function. But now we're seeing even further change here. And I guess to best exemplify this, this is um, some aerial photography from the 1930s. And uh, this is situated on the southern portion of the city of Cedar Falls at that time. Uh, I would say with the major roads there are University Avenue and Hudson Road for folks that are familiar. And you notice this blue squiggly line cutting across the landscape there. And then you jump 90 years to close to present time and we can see a pretty stark comparison in the landform use there. What was originally primarily prairie, maybe some wetland areas, then converted to row crop production, land use. And then now we have heavily urbanized environments with roads, with buildings, and lots of uh, people living in and around and utilizing this land. And you still see that blue squiggly line cutting through there, but it has seen some significant changes just in the last few hundred years. And that little river or stream is still trying to do what it can 
And for those um, who maybe don't know, that's good old Dry Run Creek there. And this isn't just an isolated experience here in Dry Run Creek. Um, we've noticed throughout their state that we do have a growing population, that our urban areas are becoming more urbanized, uh, that there is agricultural lands that is now being developed and converted to, to housing, to, to uh, human use. And so that's further changing these blue squiggly lines that scatter our landscape here and the way they function in the hydrologic model. All right, so to put some numbers to this stormwater runoff, if we're out in a natural area, well, and we have a rainstorm come in because we have plants, because we have vegetation, we have root structures and systems growing, when that rain falls, about half of it goes into the ground. It's absorbed, utilized by these plants, can go into the groundwater system, things like that. Plants are utilizing it uh, through the evapotranspiration process and it's going back up into the air. Um, and then we see a little bit of stormwater runoff from that. But then when we get in our urbanized environments, we see that infiltration decrease because there's less green areas for water to go. It's kind of hard for water to be absorbed in concrete unless there's cracks in it. So we see that runoff increase and that evapotranspiration decrease. But then we get heavily urbanized environments. We see very little water infiltration and a significant amount of runoff. So a lot of times folks think, wow, you know, I just live here in my happy little home. You know, what role do I have in stormwater? Why is this an issue? So we're gonna continue using our magical minds of imagination. We're gonna go with the average size home here and have uh, exactly a one inch rainstorm event fall on this average size home on this average size lot. So just from the roof and patio area, you can estimate about 900 gallons of stormwater runoff is coming off the, the building alone. Add in an average size driveway, that's an additional 500 gallons coming off from that. And then when you include the yards, which a lot of time can be composed of compacted soils, maybe some very clay soils that don't let water infiltrate easy, easily. So just in this one inch rainstorm event, on this average lot, you can see about 4,000 gallons of water running off the land, going into the street, um, a lot of times being utilized by the stormwater systems and being piped away. So that's just one home. And then you add during one rain event, and then you add in that, you know, we see anywhere between 30 to 40 inches of rain here in our state on average each year. So I'll say that can be about 128,000 gallons of rain each year from one home. So then you scale that up to all the homes that are in a community, and then you add in the roadways and the buildings. And you can see why it really adds up quickly the amount of water we're talking about here. And the water, you know, a lot of time it utilizes our storm drain system and is piped away. So that way, yep, I would say we're protecting our infrastructure. We want to protect our homes and our investments there. You know, no one wants to get flooded or anything like that. Um, but the, the downside to, to getting this water away in a very efficient manner possible is that this water then outlets to our local river streams and ponds areas and it's not treated. So any pollution it picks up along the way, whether that's litter, whether that's chemicals, anything like that, that gets carried in the stream chain or in the storm drain channel to our, our water bodies. And that's where it can lead to problems. And so we're talking both water quantity as well as water quality issues. So you can easily think about some of the chemicals that might be caught in there oil runoff, hydrocarbons, you know, nutrients, you know, fertilizer from lawns, chemicals, things like that. Um, and that's what can impact the aquatic creatures that live in and around our streams. And then when you think about water quantity, um, we can have localized flooding or large scale flooding when we have these high intensity rainfall events and heavily impervious surfaces. There's nowhere for that water to go um, so it builds up and that's where we can have issues. Um, and that's where we can see 
stormwater damage, we can see uh, sluffage and erosion along our stream areas as well, and sedimentation. So yeah, so it can just kind of build upon itself and kind of cause complications. But it's not all doom and gloom. There are lots of wonderful things out there. So we have opportunities um, through these, these issues that arise. And so this kind of demonstrates the traditional stormwater infrastructure model where we have hard surface, you know, it goes through a pipe system and then is outleted somewhere um, far away, protecting that, that wonderful family's home there. But what we're trying to utilize or trying to mimic here is Iowa's native prairie hydrology, where the majority of the stormwater is absorbed into the ground and gets a chance to infiltrate where it can remove a lot of the pollutants. I'll say it can recharge our groundwater and, and just help, help out, um, help reduce both the water quality and water quantity issues. So that's the goal with our infiltration-based practices that uh, comprise a lot of urban conservation here in our state. So now we'll do a quick dive into what some of these urban conservation practices look like. So rainwater harvesting, rain barrels, uh, detention systems. Obviously, these are like the gateway drugs to urban conservation. These are something small, simple, you can set it up yourself, you know, go to the store, buy one for, you know, 30 to $100, set it up, and this will give folks a great appreciation for how much water is coming off their home each year. These, a lot of times, 55-ish gallon drums fill up very quickly from even small rain events. Um, but the important things with rainwater harvesting is if you don't use it, you lose it. You know, if you don't utilize the water you're collecting in these barrels, you know, utilizing it for your garden, for your plants, um, you know, your flower beds, things like that, and it's just sitting there, then it's not really having a, a con the water conservation benefit we're going for. So keeping in mind that and incorporating these rain barrels into an area that's going to be most beneficial for you, so close to your garden or flower bed where you'll be utilizing it. Otherwise, yep, you, you can use, you know, the hoses or, yep, little rain bu buckets, water buckets to, to convert the, the water around to where you're needed. And I would say the important thing with rainwater harvesting is this is not for human consumption at all. This is strictly for, for use on plants. And there are recommendations out there, you know, not necessarily put it on the fruit of the plant, put it at the base, things like that. But like I said, this is very simple and easy um, way to get involved with urban conservation right off the bat. So another great opportunity to incorporate urban conservation is by utilizing native prairie landscaping. So especially when we think about us only having less than one-tenth of one percent of our remnant tall grass prairie here in our state, anywhere where we can incorporate these prairie plants is going to be beneficial. And probably one of the, the best examples of that is by providing habitat for our pollinators. We know the plight that our, our monarchs and bees are facing, and so pollinators really benefit from this uh, from native prairie landscaping. And so this is bees and butterflies and birds as well and the creatures that live in and around them. And by providing food and habitat for them, I'll say we're helping, we're helping them out significantly. And these can be done in very attractive manners that also help out, um, you know, raise positive attitudes towards prairie as well. And also highlight that when we think about our traditional lawns, um, I always tell folks, however short you mow your grass is how deep your root structure is. So if you're mowing to two inches, you have two inches of roots beneath the ground. And when you compare that to our native prairie plants, they can have several feet of, of root structures and they can do a fantastic job of breaking up clay soils. They can break up compaction. They can have uh, great, great channels for water to infiltrate much better through their root systems. And then they're adding, um, you know, great opportunities for our soil microbes, 
providing them with some food and some sustenance. Um, so this is, like I said, this is returning Iowa to, to what it was pre-settlement and a great benefit. And these can be small landscape features and even just including, you know, a few milkweed plants. You're helping out our, our monarchs. But you can do larger areas as well. And so this not only includes the flowering forbs, but we also have our native prairie grasses and there's even native prairie turf out there as well and so ways to incorporate that and like i said there's lots of wonderful folks here um, that are, are in this video series so i'm not a native prairie professional by trade and so i'll maybe leave some of this um, for them to to highlight but i would say native prairie landscaping is a fantastic opportunity to get involved with conservation so we are so uh benefited here um, about the opportunities native prairie landscaping provides. And there's just such a wide variety of species that work well in a wide variety of conditions, whether you have compacted clay soils or very fast draining soils, whether you have very high full sun conditions or you have a shaded area of your yard you'd like to incorporate native prairie. Um, if you have, you know, you want to attract specific insects and or pollinators. I would say there is such a wide variety of prairie species out there that do well in our local landscapes um, that I would say you can really get anything you want. Um, but one thing I always try and caution folks is to be aware of your local municipality, um, if they have specific rules, regulations on what you can plant, where it can, where you can plant it. Because a lot of times, um, you know, there's, there can be height restrictions on plants. Um, so I would say you don't want to create a nuisance or, or a safety issue. So putting, being smart about where native prairie plantings are getting put, you know, you don't want to do it right next to a sidewalk where a plant's going to get 10 feet tall and droop over. You won't want to necessarily do it at the end of your driveway so that way you can't see where you're backing out. So there's just some common, common, um, solutions for that stuff but like i said ensuring that you're going to be in line and not create uh ruffle feathers of your friends your neighbors or or your local municipality very key stuff um, but lots of great resources lots of great opportunities out there um, for native prairie landscaping so another really beneficial urban conservation practice is called soil quality restoration and what the goal with SQR is to try and utilize our existing landscape or existing lawns and make them function better. So this is a step process that starts off by aerating the soil. And ideally, if we can use deep tie-in aerators where we're going down you know, six to eight inches or so, um, breaking that does a great job of breaking up soil compaction, opening pore spaces, for, for the soil here. And then there's an application of high quality compost. And this is usually about a quarter to a half an inch uh, in thickness, um, just enough to try and add, add some of that to the, the soil. And I would say over a few days to, to a, a week or so, this compost breaks down, fills in these pore spaces, and then is utilized by the soil microbes there. And it is a huge boost uh, for their activity there and really just just helps the soil function more like a sponge rather than a hard surface as some of our compacted clay soils um, can can cause and so yep so i'll say returning our soils to a more functioning model and i would say yep that's great but i would say for for a lawn care enthusiast out there there's an additional benefit by adding this high quality compost there, you are adding a huge organic boost to that soil. And that really helps the, the soil function better. So what you'll commonly see is the grass is greener earlier in the year. It can handle the, the drier summer conditions and may even stay greener late in the year. So you kind of see that bottom right hand corner demonstrates that um, and some of the, ben like I said, the, the keeping up with the Joneses benefits type work. So now we're going to dive into my favorite urban conservation practice of all, rain gardens. So rain gardens are landscape depressions in the ground, and their, their goal is to temporarily pond and store water runoff, usually from a downspout, maybe maybe a driveway or some, some specific hard surface. 
It's directed towards the rain garden where, yep, it will slowly infiltrate into the ground over a few hours, no more than 24 hours. We want water sitting there. And sometimes if we have less than ideal conditions, you might have to do what's called an enhanced rain garden, which just involves maybe excavating a little bit deeper, maybe involving um, some more stormwater infrastructure um, into that as well. Um, but the tent for these is to be beautiful landscape features um, that benefit our land. And so the great thing about rain gardens is each one of these is customized for the homeowner themselves. This is um, based on their landscape, their drainage patterns, where their roofs and buildings are, where the water's going. Um, it's also factored by their budget. Some of these were done by professional landscaping companies. Some of these were done by volunteers and the homeowners themselves. So some of these are more expensive than others. And some of these, um, I'll say a wide variety of plants that can be utilized in these, these rain gardens. And so a lot of times this, that's a factor in deciding um, what plants get put in there. And that's where the homeowners get involved with what they want to see. And I'll say the shapes, I'll say pretty much can be modified any which way. Some of the aesthetic features as well. Um, main requirements are just properly sizing the rain garden and that helps ensure its uh, function and longevity. Um, but as you can see in these photos, there's just such a wide variety. And these are just, you know, the, the few dozen that we've done here in Dry Run Creek over the last few years. And like I said, this is great opportunity for homeowners to, to have a role in conservation. You know, everyone has downspouts, so this is just a great opportunity there. So if folks are curious about rain gardens, well, I would say probably the one-stop shop to find out all about rain gardens is the Iowa Rain Garden Guide. And so this was just updated just a few years ago, and this includes everything in there, the step-by-step -step process for installing a rain garden, the siting conditions, recommendations, calculations uh, for how much materials you're going to need. I mean, it really is everything. This is the intent is for this that any homeowner could pick this up, read it, and feel um, a little bit more confident uh, with a rain garden, have a full understanding of it. But this is the same thing that professional conservationists and landscapers uh, util utilize as well. Um, so you can go ahead, hop online, give that a download, and dive in. Like I said, it's a really great feature there um, that's very beneficial indeed. And I would be amiss. Uh, to not include some of the photos of the, the wonderful volunteers we've had the pleasure of working with over the years on helping implement rain gardens. So we've uh, partnered with conservation groups, with homeowners, with students from uh, first grade all the way through college and everyone in between. So like I said, this isn't something big and scary. Uh, this is something that uh, folks can get involved with. You know, a lot of times you can get these knocked out in a, a weekend. So yep, if you're looking for for a perfect summer way to spend uh, a summer weekend, I would say rain garden to your landscape might be a great opportunity for you. So another conservation opportunity is permeable pavement. And um, so a couple different forms utilized here in our state, uh, permeable pavers and porous asphalt. And so I'll say we understand that, yep, I'll say we need our road systems, we need our streets, parking lots, and our driveways. You know, those aren't going anywhere, but there's a way to make them a little bit greener to reduce their impact and utilize them as green infrastructure. I mean, that's a huge win there. So the intent of permeable pavement is to still keep the pavement in place. I would say you can drive on it, you can do all the normal uses you would, um, but then it utilizes a large rock chamber underneath. And so there's usually several layers of rock of different size rock aggregates um, to create uh, storage, storage areas for that stormwater runoff. The pavers are set off a little bit each. And so you can kind of see in that lower left hand corner um, that there's a little bit of space between each of the pavers and that's filled with small rock chips. So that's where water can be or work its way through the pavers down into that rock chamber system. Uh, for porous asphalt, um, it kind of has air pockets and channels with it. So on the top, it might look like uh, similar to uh, traditional asphalt, 
um, but it almost has a rice crispy like texture. So water works its way through the, the top layer of the pavement into the rock chamber system, and that's where it can slowly work its way into the surrounding existing soils. And these do a lot of times include um, stormwater infrastructure, so some pipings, um, just uh, to handle large rain events, ensure that there isn't water sitting in there for extended periods of time. We don't want an underground pool or anything like that in these rock chambers, but wide variety of use. You can see uh, alleyways, parking lots, driveways. Um, so great opportunities for homeowners to get involved. And like I say, also reduce their, their stormwater impact as well. So a lot of this work, you might be thinking, well, well how, how can I even do some of this stuff? Well, I'll say, you know, if it takes a team, you know, we're all partners in this together. So no one's alone in the realm of conservation here. So my role as a watershed coordinator is to work with landowners to try and help identify what conservation might be a good fit for their home, uh, try and help them with the process. Sometimes we can utilize financial incentives. Sometimes they're just looking for the technical resources. Uh, so there's folks like myself and I'll say there's watershed coordinators throughout the entire state, but then there's lots of other uh, conservation professionals that can provide the same services as well. So some days out there hugging trees, playing in the dirt, swimming in the water, but a lot of times that's behind the scenes work, uh, doing the paperwork that's involved for the to make this happen. And a lot of times what that starts off with is getting a plan in place. So this is going out, meeting someone out in the field, trying to identify what their concerns are, what what conservation op solutions there are and get a feel for, for where, where the happy medium is between the two. And I have to say, I think the Natural Resource Conservation Service has one of the, the best mottos in the area, um, helping people help the land. And I think that's really the mentality uh, urban conservationists take. You know, we're not anti-development. We don't wanna tear down homes and break up roadways. We're trying to find that happy medium of sustainable green solutions where we can all be happy in our homes, we can all drive our cars down the road, um, but we can do it in a way that, that doesn't have a detrimental impact on our environment. And if anything, we can help improve our environment with this use of urban conservation work. And so, yep, so I'll say sometimes that involves, involves surveying, siting, designing, uh, hopping on the computer to come up with a wonderful plan so that way a homeowner can do that. So there's contractors, there's conservation professionals, there's lots of folks out there that can be resources for, for homeowners such as yourself. All right, so speaking of potential resources, like I said, it's not just the, the conservationists out there. There's work that even you can do um, from the comfort of your own home uh, to, to look into urban conservation here. So probably one of the, the best one-stop shops for urban conservation in our state is the Iowa Stormwater Education Partnership, or also known as ISWEP. You can hop on their website there, they have a plethora of resources and informations for you there, pretty much covering every topic of urban conservation. So, you know, we hit a lot of the smaller residential ones, but there's even more urban conservation practices out there that are maybe for more large scale, um, you know, whether that's large businesses or even regional neighborhoods, things like that. So, like I said, lots of conservation opportunities up there and ISWEP is a great resource. You can hop over to their website and kind of download any of these brochures, get connected with further resources and information. Uh, so definitely check them out. Another one, if you're kind of curious what might be a good fit for your home, you can hop on to the US Environmental Protection Agency Stormwater Calculator. So this is wonderful. Just go to that website down there and I'll say you can type in your address and this will, you know, ping your home there and it will tell you about your, your soils, it will tell you about your hydrology, you know, your precipitation, a lot of those features like that. Um, but then the really cool feature that can come up is you can try and prioritize maybe your levels and interest in how you might want to control your stormwater runoff from your home. So if you're really excited about rain gardens, you could bump that up. If you decide no permeable pavement is for you, take that all the way down. 
but you can run any number of scenarios with this and play around. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna print up a report for you and, and kind of show the different scenarios you can look at. So this is a really great resource. Like I said, you can do it from the comfort of your home, uh, do a quick dive and maybe get a little bit of basic information and help identify what might be what you might be interested. All right, so another big question lots of folks have is, okay, yep, I wanna do this conservation. How can I afford this? And so that's where there are financial incentives throughout the state that, that homeowners and businesses and um, institutions, everything in between can qualify. So here in Dry Run Creek, we've utilized a variety of grant funds to keep our watershed improvement project going uh, for 18 years now. And so we've been, uh, say this involves writing grants, this involves pulling partners together. And so obviously we've been able to do that, but not everyone lives in Dry Run Creek. I know you all love to, but yep, not everyone can, but there are other active watershed improvement projects throughout the state. Um, and I'll say there's other resources as well, especially if you live in a municipal area, if you live in a city, um, there is a chance that your municipality might utilize some of the stormwater fee that you pay on your monthly water bill and they redirect that as cost share for homeowners. Um, so that would be a great place to start. If you do live within a city, um, contacting your local stormwater specialist or your engineering department, um, sometimes they might be located within that and just inquiring if there is a local cost share program for urban conservation work. Another great resource for folks, uh, your local soil and water conservation district. So each county in our state has uh, a soil and water conservation district made up of elected officials, uh, the soil and water conservation district commissioners that volunteer their time to help protect our land. And they work with a variety of partners um, to, to try and help do that, and so they can be great resources. I'll say the commissioners might not necessarily come out and inspect your home to see if a rain garden is a good fit, but they can work with um, you know their other partners uh, through the office and try and help identify maybe a potential resource for you there. So if you're unsure where your local soil and water conservation district is, uh, you don't know where the office is or who to contact, you can go ahead and hop on that IDOL's website there and get further information. I kind of mentioned earlier, um, you know, there are lots of active watershed improvement project efforts here in our state. Um, there's, there's agencies and groups that are pulling together resources to try and help improve water quality and on both the smaller scale and the larger scale. And so this involves working with landowners, get conservation on the ground. Some of these do include some urban conservation use as well. Um, so I would say, yep, your soil and water conservation district would know, yep, if you do happen to be within a specific watershed, water, targeted water body where there are funds available. So uh, that's where your SWCD can try and help get you connected as well. Just because we're talking about watersheds, I'd be amiss if I didn't highlight their watershed management authorities. And I would say we're can see how much of our state is getting covered um, with these WMAs. So these are partners, groups coming around the table um, from counties, cities, um, SWCDs, and organizations, everyone in between that try and looking at improving water quality throughout our state. So it really is a targeted um, team effort to try and help improve water quality. So there are lots of resources that homeowners like yourself can get involved with um, to try and help as well. All right, so I've done lots of talking so far. So I suppose it's time to try and get this all pulled together here uh, for you folks. So a lot of times folks reach out to me um, when there's an issue, when they uh, have waterfront property that they did not intentionally buy when they signed on to this home. And you know, that is common. We are seeing um, localized um, water issues, especially with higher intensity rainfall events. Um, so these do become more and more problematic for folks as we do as our urban areas get more developed as we get higher rainfall events more intense rainfall events um, that's where these issues can be created uh, but like i said these issues are opportunities uh, for solutions 
And so that's where we try and utilize this urban conservation. So we can help improve water quality here. I would say we can reduce the, the pollution and chemicals that are getting into our water bodies, impacting the aquatic creatures there. A lot of times this urban conservation is intended to be attractive landscape features. So you are adding features to your land that I would say is not only attractive to, to us people, but I would say we're helping out our, our pollinators as well. Um, you know, our monarchs, they're definitely in need of that. So when we can add flowering plants that they've been adapted to over thousands of years that they benefit from, I would say that's, that's, that's a win for, for lots of folks here. And really, when you think about it, um, urban conservation is you being a good neighbor. Um, water flows downhill, and so unless you're at the bottom of the hill, you have a potential to impact someone by your choices. I always highlight, we all live in a watershed, we all have a role to play. So if you can reduce your stormwater footprint on your own home, by even by a small amount, I would say it's, it's having a growing effect uh, by your neighbor, um, by someone who lives further, you know, as the city that lives downstream from you. So I'll say it's not just your, your neighborhood, I'll say it's our regional neighbor and just our, our metaphorical neighbor, because um, we all live in a watershed. Value stands to, to best benefit from urban conservation is our future, our future generations. I mean, they're gonna be the folks that inherit our land. You know, they're our future homeowners, they're our future mayors, our future representatives or educators and stuff. So I would say anything we can do to try and help improve our land, I would say we, we leave a lasting legacy. So, um, you know, even if it's just your small thousand square foot home, you are leaving a legacy for, for the future. And I'll maybe just take a brief step down from, from the soapbox there. You don't have to install an urban conservation practice uh, to feel good about yourself or to sleep at night. I am not intending to try and keep anyone awake or say you have to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars to renovate your home um, just to be a good person. There are very simple, easy steps that anyone can do um, to try and help reduce their stormwater uh, footprint. And I'll say some of the best things you can do for water quality, I'll say, I, how, how could I not highlight that trees are, are wonderful and beneficial um, for, for stormwater being on a Trees Forever webinar here. Um, but I'll say raising awareness for water quality and conservation, I'll say whether that's your friends, whether that's your family, whether that's your elected representatives, whether that's your colleagues, um, anyone that I'll say, if you're passionate about urban conservation or, you know, you're, love rain gardens, I would say, why not talk to someone about it? Strike up a conversation. You never know where that's gonna lead. And I would say it can all have that growing growing impact um, at where we all get the benefit from. And then I will say, I always try and highlight, you know, in your in your own backyard in your, or your front yard, I would say you have, I mean, it's your own little farmland, pretty much I like to highlight. So, you know, if you're putting pesticides on there, if you're putting herbicides, if you're putting fertilizer on there, I mean, that's all having an impact. It might be small scale, but especially in our urban environments, I mean, that builds up significantly. And so doing the same thing um, we work with our farmers on, using the right rate at the right time and the right place and right source of the four R's, I mean, that that is essential work. So I'll say it's not just for, for our farmers and producers, that's for homeowners as well. So making sure that, yep, I'll say your fertilizer, you're not doing it right before a rainstorm is going to happen. Um, you know, you're not using de-icer and throwing road salt on there um, all over your sidewalk and driveway um, and then letting it, um, you know, in huge unnecessary quantities there. So say being smart about, I'll say, about that use is really important as well. And then just, I'll say general good housekeeping. You know, if you want, if you mow your, or mow your yard just a little bit higher, you're increasing the root structure just a little bit more. So I'll say if you can stomach it and your neighbors don't get too mad at you, yeah, let, let grow, raise your deck a half an inch and just kind of see how that goes. And yep, and I'll say making sure that your leaves and grass clippings don't end up in the storm water um, storm drain system. I'll say so raking them or piling them in an area where they're not just gonna gonna get washed away is really really key. You know, cleaning up your pet waste. I'll say that's important. You know, reduce E. coli in our streams. Don't litter. Like I said, lots of simple activities that folks can do to get involved with conservation as well.
And then one of the best ways you can get involved and show your support of conservation is by getting involved, donating your time, um, volunteering. Um, there's lots of conservation efforts throughout our state, um, both in our urban areas and our rural areas. And so there's advisory groups, there's watershed projects, there's WMAs, there's boards. Um, I would say getting involved with any of those organizations um, and voicing your support, lending your time and your talents, Obviously, that, that's supremely beneficial. And so, yeah, there's lots of opportunities. You can get certified as a water monitor. You can get involved with a stream cleanup. You can do a stream cleanup yourself. And I'll say it doesn't even have to be a big cleanup. I'll say if you pick up a pop bottle, um, you know, anytime you walk out in a hiking area, even just one has a growing impact. So these can be super small steps um, that, that are beneficial. And, and what I'd say, you know, staying connected, um, you know, whether that is with groups going to meetings or just uh, getting on social media and following these groups, finding out what's going on. That's probably the best way to stay informed and keep up to date on what's going on there. So like I said, a little bit of time, but that, that's a, a big benefit as well. So I know you're always supposed to end presentations to, to highlight why you got involved with conservation. And um, that guy sitting on, on that beach over there, that's my, my nephew. And I would say that's kind of going back to the future. I would say they're the reason why I got involved with conservation. I want to leave uh, the world a little bit better than what, I, when, what it was when I found it. And I would say my nephews and uh, nieces are a motivating force for that. And, and yep, I would say getting out, enjoying our natural resources is one of the best way, um, you know, appreciating what we have and trying to protect them. So, okay, end of spiel there. Um, I'll say, I'm, I know we're gonna take some questions uh, here, but I'll say, I'm leaving my contact information up here. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. You know, I can't always give you an answer, but I can hopefully at least get you connected to someone who can on any wide variety of topics. But I'll say urban conservation, that's by far my favorite thing. Always happy to talk with folks about that. So thank you for paying attention. And I'll say, looking forward to our questions and conversation here. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Josh. Uh, that was a really fascinating presentation there. So let's get to some questions and answers. Uh, totally off topic, but I'll ask anyways if there is time. Well, this could be interesting. Uh, how does one <laughs> relocate what we believe to be as a carpenter bee? Oh, interesting. Well, I'll take a stab at this, if only because Pollinator Palooza is coming up in two weeks. And so I know a little bit about that much. Um, one of the things that we would need to find out is, is a carpenter bee a, a ground nester or is it one of those cavity nesters? So we have these different pollinator, the bees, different pollinators that are either going to, in underground, utilize old burrows or chambers that other uh, critters have made or even make their own to a certain extent. Um, and that's where they're going to live their lives. And then others are going to basically have holes um, in dead trees, stems, all sorts of different things where they're going to um, burrow into there and lay their eggs, so on and so forth. So uh, you need to find out if the bee that you're looking at is a cavity nester or a ground nester. The other thing you might consider is what they're looking for is uh, undisturbed areas. So pollinators need undisturbed areas. Again, if their nest is underground, uh, they don't want to have lawnmowers going over them once a week and, and causing all sorts of problems or, or animals' hooves, right? And so they need that undisturbed area. So that might be um, under some trees that don't get mowed or that are mulch. Oh, here we go. We think it's nesting in our mulch area where the ground squirrel may have been. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Then it's a ground nester, and that's the undisturbed area. So, um, yeah, good luck with that, and report back to us, Andrew. Uh, that's a little bit of a, a unique one. Okay, Josh, right up your alley here. How long can you keep rain barrel water? Um, okay. So, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, you know, the water is going to stay in there. Um, you know, it's not going to get sour or anything like that. Um, but I would say, you know, the, the more you can utilize it, you're flushing out the system. Because what can happen is uh, you can get algae buildup. Um, you can have, and especially if it's not a perfect seal, that's where you can get um, mosquitoes or pests in there. And so I always say, yeah, probably the best way to avoid having 
um, issues with your rainwater is to utilize the water. Um, some, some additional ways, if you are worried about mosquitoes, um, putting a few drops of dish soap, if you can put that in the top, uh, that creates a nice layer um, that mosquitoes can't utilize, they can't lay their eggs in, um, but yeah, like I said, the, the more you can use the water, the better, but it's not like it's going to go bad necessarily. You just might have some issues over time if it sits for, for a long period, uh, especially with that, that algal buildup. Great, great answer. Thanks, Josh. And we're going to continue with rain barrels here. Uh, what do you recommend doing with the barrels in winter? Okay, yes. And so, yep, I, that's me. I didn't get into the specifics on that. Um, but yes, you don't want to keep your rain barrel uh, installed year round. Um, you want to disc at least disconnect it from the downspout. Um, so that way it's not getting water in there because otherwise that water is going to freeze over the winter. Then you crack your rain barrel and then it doesn't function anymore. Um, so depending on how you have it hooked up, um, sometimes uh, there's a simple easy disconnect where you just disconnect the hose. Otherwise, if it's more of a traditional rain barrel where it sits right underneath your downspout, um, try and um, move it away from that. So that way, like I said, it's not collecting water. Make sure you empty it out. Um, I was I usually try and do it uh, when may not necessarily when the first freeze comes, but if you notice that there's going to be uh, overnight periods, especially in the fall, where it's getting down into the low 30s, especially if it's getting into the 20s, that's the best time to go ahead and disconnect your rain barrel. So that way it's there for you next spring and they can just hook it up once we start getting those warmer temperatures. Fantastic. Now, Josh, I have to tell you, so Trees Forever, uh, we just went through a complete campus redo here last year and we incorporated a lot of these um, features into our campus. So we like to think of it as a learning laboratory. And next week, we're having uh, Ag Secretary Mike Nag out. And we're going to do a little dog and pony show, show off the rain barrels. Mm -hmm. We put in a giant cistern that's going to collect a lot of that rainwater. The native plants have been put in, uh, the trees and everything else. Uh, so that is just fantastic that uh, we'll be able to showcase some of these concepts to others uh, to really get them spread out there. So nice now one of the interesting ones that you provided um, an example of was that soil quality restoration and i found that fascinating because i have seen some of the soil in some of these developments these residential developments after the construction happens and they will bury cardboard and debris and just garbage in there and it's usually clay and so it's just really tough sometimes to get things to grow in there. And so I love that idea of essentially topping it off. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, and so the, I mean, I think especially in post-construction areas is probably where it stands the most to benefit from the soil quality restoration because yep, you have heavy equipment moving around. Obviously that compacts the soil. Um, you know, throwing throwing a few inches of topsoil and sod on top, yep, that can, can help a little bit. But then when you're trying to plant trees that need deep root structures, um, that's a lot of times when I get calls from folks um, that, yep, you know, they just planted, you know, five bushes and all of them are dying and, and yeah, but it was hard getting them in there uh, because of these clay soils. So really, like I said, the decompacting the soil is probably one of the, the best, best ways to open up those pore channels and then this huge organic matter boost with this high quality compost. Um, that's just really trying to, to get it um, so it's not the, the lawn isn't acting like a concrete impervious surface. It's acting more like a sponge where water can be absorbed, where plants and trees can utilize this organic matter. And, and like I said, it can just function a lot better. So there are contractors out there that do aerate soil. You know, you can rent an aerator from, from your local uh, rental facility. Um, but obviously getting that high quality compost, that's not necessarily uh, spread throughout the state. Um, so like I said, that's maybe gonna be a good time to go ahead and get a hold of your, if you have a local watershed coordinator or soil and water conservation district, they can kind of get you in contact with some of the contractors and some of the sources for that. If you're looking to do it yourself or have a professional come out and do it. Yeah. Hey, another one here that's really interesting that needs to be answered. Now, do you need to put landscape fabric under mulch in a rain garden? How do you keep unwanted plants out of the garden? Uh, I'm looking to do a down and dirty rain garden in my yard. So traditionally, we don't recommend the landscape fabric in rain gardens um, just because 
Um, you know, if material gets collected in there, it can create an impervious surface almost or restrict the flow into the rain garden, which is what we want to try and avoid. Um, so the mulch, the intention of the mulch is to try and help be a weed barrier in itself. Um, but yep, I'll say, especially that that first year, um, we tell folks, yep, you probably are going to be weeding a bit more. But I'll say once the prairie plants get established, they should be out competing the weeds. Um, but I'll say it's a lot like traditional landscape. Yep, you're going to be in there a little bit, but that's half the fun is getting your hands dirty, spending an afternoon out in the sun, working on your suntan, and like I said, helping uh, your rain garden look a little bit better. So yeah, traditionally, unless it's very porous, um, I, I would highly recommend avoiding the landscape fabric within the rain garden. Got it, got it. Great answer. Oh, so someone wants to know, how does using a thatcher help your grass and when how often should you use it hmm so i would say i guess i you know we we sometimes if we're maybe converting um traditional grass to to uh native prairie um we might use a thatcher obviously that's about the extent of my experience um but first we're killing off the the grass the existing vegetation and then we thatch it to to try and remove some of that and then we'll, we'll seed the native prairie seed. So we just did that um, uh, here um, for a winter seeding. And so I'll say I'm excited to go out and check out to see how that establishment went here. Um, but that's, that's the extent of my, um, my experience with thatching. You know, I'm not a lawn care expert, so, so I, don't, I can't, I can't uh, recommend that. Um, but I would say, you know, that might be a, a good question. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if, if you have much insight uh, I, I don't. Uh, so you're spot on in terms of if we're going to do a native seeding, uh, we want good seed to soil contact and you don't want that native seed buried very far. So basically right on top of the ground. And then you mentioned, I think you said a winter seeding. So would that yeah. be like a frost seeding where you just yes. let the net? Okay. Yep. So yeah, that would be a, a classic example of needing to use a thatcher to just remove that debris so that your soil got right onto the, or your seed got right onto the soil surface. Um, but again, we're not lawn care professionals, so <laughs> I'm going to ask your lawn master that. Oh, hey, Anne, Anne wants to know, could you talk a little more on the compost amendment to a lawn's blank spots? Um, okay. So, so yeah, um, I guess, you know, I'm assuming kind of kind of in line with the soil quality restoration. Um, so yeah, you know, especially up if you're having areas where where it's difficult getting grass established, you know, that might be a sign that yep, you know, there's some restrictive feature in there, you know, that's either yep, it doesn't quite have the 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 nutrients that the grass needs to grow, or yep, it could be yep, you know, the compacted clay soil area, maybe where something was sitting for an extended period of time. Um, so like I said, yep, that could be a really good spot where you try and do um sqr and yep i would say maybe aerate the soil or even like i said yep just just kind of breaking it up a little bit yourself adding some compost and then you can go ahead and throw your seed on there and like i said that's going to give uh the seed a boost uh that it needs uh to try and help grow um so like i said that 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 could be a really good solution for for areas where you're having difficulty getting uh lawn established excellent excellent so Josh, outreach opportunities, do you do uh, different field days or, or learning days or stuff like that in Dry Run Creek? Yes, yeah, so yep, we are, outreach is a really big component um, for, for our, our program here. So yep, so we, we do field days. Um, I would say we do best management practice tours where we take folks out around the watershed to highlight a lot of the conservation. Um, we, we do presentations kind of like this, virtual and in person. We have uh, newsletters we send out. We have a Facebook page, a YouTube channel. Um, we also have, um, yep, I'll say an interactive BMP map. And I'll say maybe include a, a link for that. So if folks do want to see what some of these conservation projects look like, like I said, I know I included a handful of photos in there. Um, but we've tried documenting um, all 260 conservation projects that we've helped implement here in Dry Run Creek over the last 18 years and have a photographic uh, reference to it on a little dot. And so, like I said, yeah, we do try and have a pretty big virtual presence. So, yeah, if you do Dry Run Creek Watershed Improvement Project, you're going to get connected to a lot of this information. Um, I would say if you happen to be here in the Cedar Valley, um, we have our practical backyard tour here next Saturday or the, the 17th. Um, so we have information on our Facebook page and our website. So yeah, folks do want to get out, see some of this conservation in person. Yep, we have plenty of opportunities coming up here. Fantastic. 
Josh, I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us today, presenting on this amazing topic and the great work you're doing in Dry Run Creek. Uh, it's important, and I think there's something that everyone can take home from the presentation here today. Well, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us for another Stewards of the Beautiful Land webinar. Uh, again, these are going to be recorded. I'll be sure to get the links sent out, and uh, I'll try to even include some of the links that Josh had, uh, that Rain Garden um, um, link. That's a great document, I know, and uh, there were some other ones that were interesting to me. That EPA uh, stormwater calculator, that seems like a really cool tool, so uh, folks should... Uh, be able to see that. And uh, remember, we're going to have two weeks pollinator palooza. We have some additional field days coming up here uh, later this month. So join us for some of those. Until then, have a great day, everyone. Take care.